Okay, so Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 24. Last week we finished the second half of chapter 1, and our conclusion was from Hebrews chapter 11. That was the definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. These words in Greek, uh, they were used in many different disciplines, including ancient Greek philosophy. It's a very abstract concept here, but God is telling us that our faith has this evidence of what you don't see. So through your life, it has to show. It's not for the sake of showing who you are, but people will have to notice that you're different than other people in this world. As we continue in Joshua, today's passage is entire chapter 2, and we'd like to see how Rahab and the spies interacted with each other. Verse 1 says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. So they're crossing that river and to that land, including Jericho. Somehow, these two young men, how do I know they're young men? If you look at Joshua chapter 6, verse 23, it describes them as young men. And it was told to king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. So somehow, they got caught. It's kind of interesting because if you compare that account with how Moses sent 12 spies and they didn't get caught. But these two people, young men, maybe they didn't have enough experience to be a spy in this capacity, but somehow they noticed them right away. And second bullet point says, Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the man who have come to you who entered your house. But they have come to search out all the land, not just Jericho. They are here to search out all the land. These Israelites, we have to catch them. And Rahab, somehow, she already hid them. And she starts lying to these representatives of the king. She said, I did not know where they were from and when the gate was about to be closed at dark. So the bad man went out. So it's interesting. She somehow lied to these people to protect these Israelites. From their point of view, Israelites were the Gentiles. Let's continue. And the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan. Obviously, they knew these two were from Israel who were camped on the east side of Jordan. So they went to that direction. I'm going to show you the map a little later. Now then, she knows that these people went after to the wrong direction. She requests this basically. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house. And at the end, she says, give me a sure sign that you are going to deliver our lives from death. So she's asking that to those two spies. And their response, and the man said to her, our life for yours even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we'll deal kindly and faithfully with you. Okay, we all know this story, right? But let's think about this for a moment. No matter what the reason was, Rahab lied in front of them. To protect us, that's for sure, but she lied. And then, how can you trust that person that she's not going to reveal the story later on? And somehow, they accepted her request and saying, Okay, let's make a little promise here. I trust you, liar. And you trust us, right? So they both somehow agreed to protect one another. In our daily lives, if someone lies for you, that means 
he or she may lie for someone else too. What do you think? But these two people somehow agreed to protect her based on their agreement. If you do not tell this business of ours to anyone, we're going to deal with you kindly. Verse 15 says, after that confirmation, Rahab did this. Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was built into the city wall, so that she lived in the wall. What does that mean? That's exactly what it means. She lived in the wall. So a lot of people I heard before saying that, oh, this wall was pretty wide. So you can have a little residential area there. Uh, the wall is kind of thick, so you can build something within the wall. That's very speculative way of looking at it. It sounds kind of awful too. Let me share this map with you. This is actually Jericho based on archaeological findings. There are two different walls, inner city wall and outer city wall. So among those in these places, they have at least three different residential quarters. So the first one up there and the middle one inside the inner city wall and the third one at the bottom. So if you look at the first and third circle, they're very close to the outer wall. So when the house was built there, they're attached to the wall as well. Some are, not all of them. So she basically lived in the wall, not the wall itself, but the house that was attached to the wall. That's better understanding than just saying it was within the wall, just one single wall. Verse 16 says, And she said to them, Go into the hills. He's just telling the spies. Or the pursuers, the representatives of the king of Jericho, they will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way back to the east of Jordan. But this is what happened. This is the direction that she mentioned. Go to the hills from the Jericho to the left, not to the right because that's the normal way of thinking. This people pursuer is going to that direction, as you can see here. So she sent those people to the right. She sent Israelites to the left. And when she says the hills, in Korean translation, it says mountains. Mountains is higher than hills. What happens is they have a lot of caves in there. If you go to that area, there are a lot of hills with caves. If you hide one of those places, it's really tough to find you. And that's why a lot of times those shepherds, they lose their sheep somewhere in one of those caves. If they don't make noise, then they cannot find them, really. So that's what happened. For three days, they stayed there, and then they went on their way later in chapter 2, which I'm not going to cover today, but please feel free to read those the rest of the chapter 2. It's going to tell the audience that they went back home safely, reported back to Joshua about what happened. Let's revisit Rahab's lie. A lot of times people say, you cannot tell the truth in this situation. This situation kind of drives me to say something other than the truth. Right? Things happened. And people who read the Bible usually bring up another example of lying back in Exodus. Those people, the midwives, were helping uh, everyone in that country. And the Pharaoh told them, when you see these Hebrew women have boys, kill them. If it's female, then it's okay. What did they do? They did not listen to the king and they let the male children live. Okay, that's one action that they disobeyed king. And second, it says this, the midwife said to Pharaoh, when Pharaoh asked them, why did you let them live? The uh, answer was, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. That's a lie. They just intentionally let those babies live. 
So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. So a lot of people say, okay, midwives lied, and then God blessed them, and Rahab lied, and God preserved her life. So depending on the situation, if you have a good purpose, good uh, reason to lie, then you don't have to be honest all the time. The one of the main examples that I use is this. And even when I was just a lay person, it bothered me so much. The missionaries in the foreign countries, they have a good purpose. They want to bring the Bible. In the old days, you have to have this printed version of the Bible to this, these countries, and then they have to go through the airport security. And they're going to ask you, who are you? I'm a tourist. No, you're not. And do you have any Bible or anything that's uh, prohibited here? No, I don't. So if they don't check, they go through the checkpoint clearly, and they celebrate, they thank God, and praise the Lord. That bothered me so much. Okay, so they lied to these authorities to meet or accomplish their goals there. And I know some missionaries, they disguise their identities. They make their fake ID. I'm not a missionary. I am a mechanic. I'm a professor. I'm a reporter. And they go to different countries because they don't allow missionaries to come to their countries for the sake of spreading the gospel. Do you think that's okay? For God's glory, I'm going to spread the gospel. So I'm a missionary, but I'm going to tell them that I'm a mechanic, for example. I'm here for my business. If that's the case, it becomes a situational truth. What the Bible says, I have to deal with it depending on my situation. Two plus two is not always four. Depending on my mood or situation, it can be seven, eight, eleven. And people say, how come you're saying two plus two equals seven? And you're going to tell them you don't understand my situation then other person has to accept that logic. All right. Bible says one thing, and people say, because of the situation, I cannot abide by what the Bible says. So Rahab's lie is justified here? No. Because this passage, Exodus, a lot of people say they lied, so God preserved their lives and then also blessed them. Let's take a look at this one. The reason why God dealt with them well was because the midwives feared God. As a believer, we're not perfect. I know some parents, out of love for their children, say this. One morning, they say, oh, I don't want to go to school. You know, Just tell them I'm sick. All right, my son is sick today, so he's not going to make it today. I love my son, so I'm going to do this for him. And do you think those children will grow up appreciating that and then be a law-abiding citizen later? I don't think so. They've seen it. They knew in practice they're going to practice something more crafty. And the parents don't think they're lying to the school authority in that sense. The problem is we lie and if you understand that you're lying, you may kind of stay away from there. A lot of times we lie without even thinking that's a lie. So uh, I, we missed you uh, last night. We had a gathering and I was a little busy. You're not. And somehow we just lose it. Just a hardened heart. You don't feel anything even if you lie. And that's really a serious problem here in this country right now. And Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31 says this, By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Bible clearly says, not because she lied, but she welcomed those spies. Literally, they welcomed the, the Greek word is just receiving them. Welcome, receive those people. 
It doesn't say anything about lying to these authorities. So we cannot tweak these verses and say, okay, lie can be okay. We can't. In the Bible, there's so many different verses about this, but Proverbs 12 says this, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. It's not just saying lying is wrong. It's an abomination, very strong word. When it uses abomination to the Lord, it's just covering few items throughout the Bible. A lying is one of them. But those who act faithfully are his delight. One time, people that I know very well, they asked me to come to their business. They recently opened a business that a long time ago. And they're saying that some people will come and check their sales. So they want to show them they have a lot of customers. So they want me to sit there with my wife and eat their food. And when they come over and then approach us and ask us, are you a client here or a customer here? And then I had to say yes. Do you live close by? Yes, I live right across the street, that kind of thing. So I told them, that's lying. And they told me, that's not lying. I said, what? Huge problem right there. They don't even see that as lying. But lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. So we're not supposed to intentionally lie. John chapter 8, verse 44, that's from Jesus. His own words right there. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Of course not. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, when the devil lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's the one who tempted Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Did God really tell you and start lying? You're not going to die. Just eat of this tree, this fruit. A liar and a father of lies. And he is speaking out of his own character. What's inside of him comes out. Deceiver, liar. So how does it impact our lives? So let's not just focus on, okay, lying versus like being truthful. But it can expand into your entire life. Meaning... You're not going to show everyone about who you are, who truly are, who you truly are, right? So think about this. There's two people there. One person, she doesn't want to show true identity. So she's basically having this space. Okay, you don't come near my space. Don't come to this space. I want to have a certain distance with you. The other person has the same thing. He doesn't feel comfortable people coming into his territory. So whenever they meet and say and doing something together, they only share that little portion that they feel comfortable sharing. Even if you know that person or have known that person for more than 10 years, you do not know anything about that person because that person doesn't open up to you. I don't open up myself to that person either. And a lot of people say this, if you do that, you get closer to that person, but you get burned, you get hurt. It, it happens all the time. The human relationship, you cannot trust anyone. We all went through that experience in our lives. Trusting somebody too much and that person betrayed me or burned from that relationship. It happens. So think about this. If it happens in your family, if it happens in your workplace, if it happens in your church, you can meet some people everywhere you go, hundreds and thousands of them. Every single day you're hanging out with these people, but you're only sharing this portion of it, right? That you feel comfortable. So even if you meet thousands of people in your life, have so many friends, if you only share that portion of you, then you are going to feel empty in that relationship. Nothing's going to satisfy you. You may have a bunch of friends, but you're not going to have any friends, basically. 
The real problem happens when you have that relationship with God. You've been coming to church all your life, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, but somehow you feel like, I'm not growing spiritually. What's going on? I don't get to know God closer than before. Same thing. Feel the same distance. Because you did not really open everything in your life to God and repent it. You haven't. That means you never experienced God's grace. And you never repented your sin either. If you're learning music instrument, for example, piano, and you've been playing, getting lessons for 20, 30 years, but you're still playing the same piece that you've been playing since the beginning of your lesson, something's not right. You don't have to get together all the time, every single day, talking to each other to get closer to somebody, but you have to show who you are. I mean, do you really know your best friend that well? How about your family members? Your parents and children, if they don't talk to each other, how much do they know each other? In dinner time or lunch time, when you have that meal together, you may have some awkward silence. Sometimes you work with somebody 10 plus years and don't even know that person that well. All you know is that person's name, what he or she can do, but nothing else. Same thing. You come to the same church, but somehow you don't know anything about anybody. And they don't know anything about you either. And that's why we always surf on the web and get to uh, this social media and then want to get this thumbs up everywhere. But that's not going to satisfy your uh, desire to be recognized by somebody else. It never happens. Just like St. Augustine mentioned, we have this little void in our heart that nothing else can fill up other than God himself. So think about this. We get the package every day. Sometimes you get two, three packages a day these days. But if you never open that package, you may know what's in there. You've never seen it. You've never used it. You only carry that box. You can carry that box for 10, 15, 20 years, but you'll never get to know what's in there. So you have to show your true identity to other people. It may be uncomfortable sometimes. Being honest, being transparent does not mean you can be rude to other people. That means you haven't grown as Christian yet. You cannot live like that. And this is a, just a very detailed application side of it because of the lie that Rahab did. But think about this area because it can come to a really useful practice you can have for changing um, the way you live. And relationship will improve as well if you change that. So Rahab lied and spy didn't do a good job. Somehow Moses' 12 spy didn't get caught, but these two young men, they didn't really have a good experience. They made a mistake too, but somehow God worked through every single mistake we made. It says, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. It mentions Boaz and David in Ruth chapter 4. That's the concluding section of Ruth. But those two names, and other names included, appear in Matthew chapter 1. And it says, Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab all the way to David the king. So Rahab, the prostitute, was used by God, preserved by God, and be a part of this Gentile woman. There are four Gentile women names mentioned in Matthew chapter 1. This is Jesus' genealogy. Boaz, David the king, they are there. But of course, it says, by Rahab. So it's not about our perfection, the things we do, but we have to know that lying is not acceptable in God's kingdom. So the reason is this. We have to see who God is first, and then we are mimicking him, right? We're imitators of God. 
So we cannot just say, okay, it happened this way, it happened that way, so I'm imperfect, you know, so be it. God does everything he wants to do. We cannot say that. When we say we are Christians, we cannot be lazy Christians. There are no such thing as lazy Christians. If you're at school, you've got to study hard. If you're at work, you're going to do your best to do your job. If you're with your family members, have a good time and do your best to have good relationship with them. Church, same thing. There's no way we can sit back and relax and enjoy the show. That's not how it is. So if you look at this verse, Numbers chapter 23, it says this, God is not man that he should lie, meaning God does not lie. Or a son of man that he should change his mind. He doesn't change his mind because he doesn't have to. As he said, and will he not do it? Meaning he will do what he says. Or has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? He doesn't lie. He fulfills what he says. We have to follow his footprint right there. We got to be honest. We got to be truthful and faithful in our lives. Because these two elements, among other things, are describing who God is. God is faithful. You hear this one all the time, actually. God is faithful. God is faithful. The word literally, the faithful, means this. To be reliable so as to be depended upon. If someone lies all the time, I cannot trust that person. I can be nice to that person, but I cannot trust that person. If I lie all the time, how can you trust me? We're supposed to be truthful. We're supposed to be reliable so as to be depended upon by others as well. We're Christians, guys. And I know those of you who went through school, high school, middle school, college, it doesn't matter. There are always people who are out there trying to cheat during the exam. Have you seen those people? Can you believe the people who are called by God to become a, a pastor or a missionary, they come to seminary, basically graduate school. Some people cheat there too. Can you believe that? It's amazing. We cannot be like that, guys. Got to be truthful. Once you have this word in your mouth, that means you have to keep that word. Again, we cannot be perfect. That I know. We all know. But we have to get better and better every single day. Just to mimic, imitate who God is. Because God is faithful. He has been faithful to us. So we are supposed to be faithful in our daily lives as well.